Sometimes I get discouraged and I almost lose my way. And I remember I'm just a pilgrim in this troubled world below. That's the reason I keep singing as I go. We're not home yet, children, so keep your eyes on the Savior just Choir sure did enjoy that. That was good. And ladies, that singing, we, we love hearing the folks sing about the Lord and uh, having a song in our heart. That'll get you through your day, won't it? Get to sing to the Lord. And uh, I've got uh, three things the pastor asked me to share with you right here, and I want to do my best to do that. And number one is my salvation experience. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm David Fullerton, and that's my wife, Susan, of 30 years. And uh, she's my girlfriend. My wife, my pal, a lot of things. and We have a good time together. We have a ball together. And she's witty. And is your wife witty, brother? She is. Oh, amen, brother. <laughs> Who's the brother? Is this? You got a wife named Susan. Brother Mike come over and introduced himself and says, I says, I'm David, that's Susan. He says, my wife's name's Susan. I didn't tell him, but I was thinking, you better sleep with one eye open, bud. And, uh, and she looked at me and said, well, you do a lot of snoring to be sleeping with one eye open. <laughs> but it's good, it's good to be married, and it's good to be saved and born again, child of God. And don't have to lay down at night fretting or worrying over that. And we got plenty that we could fret or worry over, but we don't have to worry over that. Hey, glory. And uh, in 1 John 5, 12, this is how I know I'm saved. I'll tell you how I got that way. He that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he hath not the record that God gave his Son. And we know our brother read a minute ago, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He that hath the Son hath life. And I've got him. I've got him. He's mine. I'm his. He lives inside of me. And uh, my testimony, uh, I, I was brought up as a little fellow. We was brought up in church. It was a liberal church. And there was plenty there that, that was wrong, that wasn't right. It just wasn't carried on by the Scriptures like it ought to be. But there were a couple of things there that was right good. For starters, for whatever reason, the pastor always preached from the King James. Even though you'd go out in the Sunday school rooms and there and there's all kinds of different Bibles there. But the pastor always kept the King James. I'm sure glad he did. And uh, so I, I, I learned those scriptures. I mean, as he preached, I listened. And uh, I learned that God is three parts. 
Father, Son, Holy Ghost, these three are one. I learned He created everything. He was virgin born. I learned from the hymnal and, and even from the Word of God that He bled for me, He died for me, and He shed His blood for me. And from the earliest of days, I, I believed those facts, which we know don't necessarily make you a Christian. It don't make you born again. But I, I believed the facts. Amen. And then as a kid from the pews of that church, I called on Him for salvation. I really struggled to get grounded. Uh, I was being raised primarily by the television and the radio. And I was going to a public school. And you take all that and add it up, the, the outcome typically is not very good. And uh, I just, uh, but by the time I was in my mid-20s, I was just under so much conviction. Just, I just wasn't living right and I knew it. And I found me an altar one Sunday morning and I laid down there and I repented. And uh, was I already saved? Sometimes, well, how could I have been saved because I didn't live right, you know? And I don't have to worry about it. I know I am now. You know, I'm a born-again child of God on my way to heaven. And now the second one, my calling to preach, this one's a little harder to explain because with your salvation, you can point to the Scriptures. And, and probably somewhat to your calling to preach, but... It is different. And for me, oh, back in the early, let's see, mid-90s, 1990s, early mid-90s, somewhere along there, I don't know, I just, uh, everything the preacher was preaching, he was preaching, and, and by then we were in a good church. Uh, King James Bible Church, separated, soul winning, good pastor. He's still my pastor after, well, 25, 30 years. This has been a while, I don't know, it's been a while, but... He's still my pastor, 27 years maybe. And uh, so I was just, I was listening and, and doing my best to, to follow what my pastor taught because he was teaching the Bible, amen? And uh, we'd go out visiting together and, and, and various things and giving out gospel tracts, praying together. Now, I mean laboring in prayer together. And then it just, it just come upon my soul. I just, it's just a strong, strong, desire and uh, one preacher once said that if there's something else you can find to do just go do it and there's nothing else for me to do but preach and it's my calling I'm a God called preacher and secondarily why Israel why the Jewish people and we are missionaries to the Jewish people worldwide I have work to do in Israel in Israel in the land of Israel but I also have work in, in other places. There's half the Jewish population, well, about six million Jews in the land of Israel, about six million in the United States, and it's debatable how, over how many more are scattered around the world. Uh, 15 million, 16 million, 17 million, it depends on who you talk to, whose numbers, but Jews are everywhere, but they're mostly in Israel and the United States of America. And we've got to reach them, and God's called me to reach the Jew. It started years ago, right after I was called to preach, preacher. And you know how, Pastor, sometimes you look back at things in retrospect, and you see how God was kind of putting together pieces to lead you. And, and then one day, you have your eureka moment, and it's like, uh-oh. <laughs> I, know, I know the deal now. And, and it happened with me. And, and some of these pieces, I just didn't recognize them, but some of them I did, and... Later, and so what happened was right after my call to preach, uh, I signed up for a Bible college, and I went there, and they wanted a, a, a an SAT score, and I didn't have one. I went to community college when I got out of high school, so I had a community college degree. I didn't have an SAT to get you into a four-year school, something like that, and so I signed up to get an SAT, and I went to a high school in Greensboro to take that test, and I got there. It was a Saturday morning. And there was a bunch of high school kids in there, and me. And we sat there and waited, and it was, it was a good room full. I don't know how many were there, I didn't count them, but there was a few. And we waited and waited, and nobody came. And, and uh, I kind of felt like a good preacher. Well, he had the time and an audience. He'd share the gospel with these folks. And, and I just believed the Lord wanted me to do that. And sometimes things like that can get you in trouble. I mean, if you go over to Walmart and kick you over a pop crate and stand up and start preaching, they're probably going to help you out. Literally. 
And but but I stood up and shared the gospel with those folks. I did. And I was finishing up and somebody came and asked me to leave. And and that's okay. I understand that. I do. I waited a few days and I went back to the high school to see the principal, to talk to her. I don't know why. I just I halfway kind of wanted to apologize to her if I caused her any problem or anything. I, but I knew I just wanted to go see her. And I went to see her, sitting there in her office, and I introduced myself. And she said, so you're the man that's caused me all this trouble. I said, well, what trouble? And she said, you don't understand how many Jewish kids come to this school. And I'd unwittingly just witnessed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to a room that contained Jewish kids. And I can give you stories like that again and again where it was, it wasn't me, it was God, it was ordained, and you knew it. It's a God moment. Can we call it that? And so a few years ago, and I really, to stay within my time frame, I, I, I just try to say it this way. A few years ago, the Lord just brought things together in such a way that I now had this enormous burden for the Jewish people, and I couldn't stop studying all things Israel, history, culture, geography, language, orthodoxy, Hasidism, heredity, just, just anything Israel. I just, and it's, to this, it's that way to this day. I, I, I daily, I just I study Israel and Jewish people and customs. And they're hard people to reach. They are. And according to the scriptures, they're blinded. And uh, they are blinded nationally, but individually they can be saved. And, and friends, I, I have to say, America has a, a very large national blindness. There's a, there's a real blindness to America, to who the one true God is. But our mission is to the Jewish people. I'll leave you with a story. Uh, one of my assignments at the mission is, I, I'm a switchboard operator. That's one of my assignments, and I'm kind of an alternate, but... With modern technology, you know, I can operate the switchboard from right here, even though it's in Georgia. And I talked this week with a lady from Jersey. Oh, I got to tell you this, or this story won't make sense. A couple things I got to tell you. So I gave Pastor this last time we were in. It's a Hebrew English New Testament. And our mission director, Dr. Freed, he's a saved Jew. He, he uh, had a burden to do this, this work many years soon as he's called it soon as he got saved he started the work basically and and then it really came together organizationally and he had this burden to to get the jews the gospel in their native tongue hebrew you know the new testament was delivered in greek the spoken language of the world at the time roman empire and, and the jews of the day spoke it spoke it well so Dr. Free put this together, prophecy, prophecy Edition, and we distribute these to Jews worldwide. And then most recently in the last three years, we've started Hope of Israel Baptist broadcast, and we're broadcasting the gospel in all things Israel. We're now on 70 stations. Just in the past couple of months, the Lord swung the door open for us to be on the radio in New York City. And we're on two stations there, FM and AM dial, and, uh, which is impossible to do to get on the radio in New York City. And, and the reason why is it covers all five boroughs of the city, parts of Connecticut, southern New York State, across the Hudson to the Jersey. It's a 20 million person market. This station averages peaks and valleys. If you take an average at any given moment during the day, they have 150,000 listeners. And so the Jews, 12% of New York City is Jewish. There's a million Jews there. And then if you go around the metro area, the surrounding area that I just described, there's another million. There's two million Jews within the sound of that broadcast. And then there's Gentiles that want to get Bibles to Jews. And our phone's ringing off the hook. And I talked with a lady from Jersey this week, and I'm done. A Jewish lady who wanted a Hebrew, English, New Testament. She wants to read the Bible and find out who Jesus is. The Jews don't have peace. They have a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. They don't have Messiah. They don't have Jesus. They don't have peace. They're working for it. And they need the Lord. And it's our job. It's our job to get them Jesus. And I appreciate your valuable, valuable time, Pastor. Your valuable preaching time. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you, sir.
I appreciate that good witness and that good testimony to reach the Jewish people, God's people, God's chosen people. You'd be praying for Brother Fulton and his wife as they go forward in their calling to the land of Israel. Open your Bibles tonight, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 24. Proverbs, chapter 24. Let's try to get us a little wisdom tonight. And if we want wisdom, Brother James told us that if we lack wisdom, uh, let him ask of God, who giveth liberty and upbraideth not. And um, so we come to the book of Proverbs tonight. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 10 and read down to verse number 16. Proverbs 24, verse 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul, and thou hast found it. Then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word tonight. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight through your word. May tonight be a reality check for each of us. It's good for us to do that from time to time, is to have a reality check of where we are and what we're doing. It certainly is not the easiest thing in the world to live the Christian life, but it is the most joyous. And it is the most victorious. And it has an eternal impact upon us. Lord, help us tonight as we Walk the path that you have laid before us as we minister the ministry that you've given to us as we fulfill the will of God that you have revealed to us. We know we're facing difficulties. We know that the days are difficult. But Lord, they were difficult years and years ago when the Word of God was written. These men and women in the Bible had to deal with the same things that we're dealing with today. Though maybe circumstances are different, but fundamentally we're dealing with the same issues. We're still having to deal with the same devil. We're still having to deal with sin. Lord, we need your help tonight. And so we pray that you bless this message. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And for His sake we pray. Amen. The Bible tells us in the third chapter of the book of Proverbs, and in the thirteenth verse, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. You know, a lot of times the reason we have so much problems in our life uh, many times it's what we brought on ourselves because we 
we leaned more upon human wisdom than we did God's wisdom. And the Word of God is the place to go to find God's wisdom and His message for us in the day and hour in which we live. I want to use verse 16 tonight as our text. The first, the first clause, uh, or the first two clauses of verse 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. You know, every one of us from time to time gets down. We do. We get down. We're not on the top side all the time. We're not on the mountaintop all the time. If the truth be known, we probably spend as much time, maybe a little bit more time, down in the valley than we do on the mountaintop. And, and, and I can assure you that uh, immediately following a mountaintop experience will always be a valley experience. We need not to get comfortable up on that mountaintop. We need to learn to depend upon the Lord down in the valley. And so if, if we get down uh, in our Christian walk, well, that's perfectly natural. The problem is not getting down, but staying down. That's where our problems begin to manifest themselves. It's not in our getting down, but in our staying down. You know, I, I don't know, and I can't say this with all certainty, I would be very arrogant and prideful to try to say it this way, but I just wonder if there's anything that grieves and hurts the heart of God more than a lost sinner going to hell would be one of His children to just get down and stay down and not come back up. Just quit. You know, we, we, we see it happen all the time. We'll, we'll see people that seemingly were on fire for God and, and all of a sudden they start missing. And we don't see them. We don't know where they are. But more importantly than just not seeing them, it's not so much as the quit coming, but unfortunately many of the time they quit praying and certainly quit proclaiming the gospel. They quit practicing the doctrines of God's Word and quit praising God and quit participating in what God has for them to do. And when that happens, the devil has won. He can never get our soul. The devil can never take us to hell. Praise God. We are sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. We have been washed in the blood of Christ and the, the, the blood of Christ has washed all of our sins away, past, present, and future. But if He can get us out of the fight, if He can get us on the sidelines, then He's accomplished something. I don't have the memory that I used to have for whatever reason. But I remember reading somewhere one time that in the, the study of military operations, I read that an enemy in the, the, on the field of battle was not as interested in killing an American soldier as he was wounding an American soldier because he knew that if he wounded the soldier it would take three, four, or five others off the battlefield with him to tend to him and meet his needs. The devil can't kill us. If I die tonight, it won't be the devil on my back doing the killing. It'll be because the Lord said it's time to come home. But I don't, I don't want to be out of the will of God when I come to die. When I come to the end of my race, I'd like to finish. I'd like to be on my feet and cross the finish line. 
I like to be able, like Paul, to say that I finished my course and I fought the good fight and I kept the faith. A preacher I know once said, he said, I don't know if I've fought a good fight, but I've been in a good fight. The old songwriter once said, if you're in the battle for the Lord and right, keep on the firing line. If you win, my brother, surely you must fight, so keep on the firing line. There are many dangers that we all must face. If we die fighting, it is no disgrace. A coward in the service, he will find no place. So keep on the firing line. You know, we, we could say that what Jesus did for us on the cross should be sufficient to keep us going. And it should. But we also must realize tonight that the struggles that we face from time to time and the, the heat of battle that we all face in our walk with God Sometimes it takes a toll on us. It takes a toll on all of us. I'll say this, and I hope that you'll take it in the right spirit. Because I'm not, I don't have a hidden agenda or a hidden message in what I'm about to say. But you know what? I, I, I talk with a lot of preachers down through the years. Good preachers. Preachers who, who, who stuck with it and stayed with it all the way till God called them home. But many of them would tell me when I was a young man coming along, a young preacher just starting out, they talked about how the devil fights the men of God. And I've had several of them tell me, you just don't know how many Sunday nights or Sunday uh, mornings or Wednesday nights I got home from church and began to draft my resignation. I said, I just can't do this anymore. And that happens. Most of them never execute it. It's just the devil bat battling and fighting. And like the disciples we mentioned this morning, uh, they, were, they were rowing hard to the... Contrary winds, and the Lord saw their toiling and their rowing. And He walked out there to them and brought them peace. I want to take a moment tonight and I hope to encourage you to stick with it. I don't know what you're battling. I don't know what you're going through. The Lord doesn't ever give me permission to pick out one church member and preach at them and their problem. That would be an abuse of this pulpit. But I hope to encourage you tonight because you know the struggles that you're in. You know the battles that you're fighting. And the Lord knows that we're going to fall. The Lord knows that we're going to get down. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to feel like quitting. We're going to feel like giving up. You say, well, how do you know the Lord knows that? Because He put in His Word that a just man falleth seven times. But I like the rest of that part of that verse. It says, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. You ever heard the old saying, you just can't keep a good man down? Well, tonight I want to say you can't keep a just man down. And when I say a just man, I'm talking about mankind, men and women. I'm not just talking to the men. If we've been justified by the blood of Christ and we're part of the family of God, uh, we may get down, but we don't stay down. And I want to share with you a couple of things out of this passage of Scripture that the Lord gives us to help us to stay on that firing line. First of all, 
We need to deal with the issue at hand. Why do we get down? Why, why do we get discouraged? Why do we get down uh, uh, in the mire? It's most of the time, it's because we have become weak. We have become weak. The battle, the heat of battle has wore us down. Dealing with people and dealing with situations of life, uh, of our own personal life, man, they can drag us down. And we can get weary. We pray and we pray and we pray. And it seems like nothing ever happens. We know that God can answer the prayer. We know that God can meet the need. We know that God can intervene. But He just doesn't seem to do it on our timetable. And we start getting weary. And you know, the old devil, he loves to come. And like an old buzzard, he likes to perch up on your shoulder and say, you know, if your God was going to answer this prayer don't you think He would have answered it by now? Don't you think He knows what's going on? Maybe, maybe you need to pray for something else. If God's not answering you, maybe that's just not God's will. Boy, if He gets us to quit praying, we're in real trouble. And the Lord Jesus looked at that Syrophoenician woman this morning in Matthew chapter 15 and never acknowledged her and said a word to her and, and then told her it was not meat to, to cast, to give the bread of the children to dogs. She could have gotten down and discouraged and walked away, but she had a persistence about her. And you remember she said, you're right, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs. And that woman found that a crumb from the Master's hand was more than she ever needed. So first of all tonight, my first thought is that to stay on the firing line, we need to remember where our strength comes from. Our strength does not come from ourself. When we lean upon our own strength and our own fortitude, it will fail us every time. Amen? It will fail us every time single time. The Bible tells us where our strength comes from. The Bible tells us that our strength comes from the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And I thank the Lord that our strength our strength is unlike our salvation. Once we receive salvation, we have it forever. It never goes anywhere. But our strength can begin to wane and get weaker and weaker and weaker. But Paul said, don't depend on your own strength, but find your strength in the Lord and in the power of His might. But I want to tell you something wonderful about where our strength comes from. Though it gets weak and though we get weary, the Bible tells us that our strength is renewed day by day. The Old Testament tells us in the word of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy that as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Aren't you glad it's not the opposite? As thy strength, so shall thy days be. We wouldn't be here much longer. But Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians 4.16 For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And never forget, church, never forget that not only does our strength come from the Lord, not only is our strength renewed by the Lord day after day, if God lets us wake up and see tomorrow, He'll give us strength for tomorrow. But remember how that strength comes. 
We learn that from Paul in the thorn of the flesh. His strength was waning. He was begging God to take that issue out of his life. Don't know what it was. It's not important to know what it was. But it's important to understand that he suffered just like we suffered. And he got weak just like we got weak. But he found out in 2 Corinthians 12 that in our weakest moment, that's when the power and the strength of Jesus Christ comes into our life. We've got to remember that and we've got to rely on that and to lean upon that. So when the Lord Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, Paul just responded and said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. The second thing we need to remember about staying on the firing line is not only remembering where our strength comes from, but number two, let's remember our role in rescuing the sinner. If we get weak and we get out of the fight and we get out of the race and we just sit down and we don't get back up, yes, we're going to fall, but if we don't get back up, how many will die and go to hell that the Lord could have put in our path that we could have talked to. You know what? They may have asked Brother Fullerton to leave that high school. He may have caused that principal a lot of problems. But only heaven will reveal how many of those Jewish boys and girls and how many of those Gentile boys and girls that was in that school that day and heard the clear presentation of the gospel. Only heaven will reveal how many of them trusted Christ. They may not have knelt down that day and asked Christ to save them. But you see, once that seed is planted, then the Lord does the watering and the Lord gives the increase. Our job is not to save people. Our job is to tell people how to be saved. The Lord Jesus is in the saving business. But we must remember our role in rescuing the sinner. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. He's addressing those who have opted to turn their head away and to not see the plight of the lost. Oh, I didn't know that I was supposed to talk to them. Oh, I didn't know that they were in need of the gospel. But you see, the Lord reminds us, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? Now who is he that pondereth the heart? That's the Lord. It is God that knoweth our heart. And he that keepeth thy soul. By the way, those of you that are saved, he keeps our soul. We're kept by the power of God. He says, he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? We have a responsibility to carry this gospel to a lost and dying world. Now we have the opportunity here at this church, as many other churches do, to proclaim this gospel not only to this congregation, but to people all over the world who happen to tune in to welcomedoorbaptistchurch.org. They get to hear the Word of God. But that's not the only way we fulfill our responsibility. We also fulfill our responsibility by supporting missions and supporting missionaries who are going out to fields that God needed a, a, a witness and God needed someone to present the gospel around the world and here at home. And so we get our responsibility 
uh, we take care of our responsibility by preaching the Word of God, sharing it with the world. We also fulfill our responsibility by supporting missionaries and getting the gospel around the world. But we have a personal responsibility. Well, when the Lord Jesus was explaining in Acts chapter number 1 about the role of His Christian and the role of His church, He said, and ye shall be witnesses unto Me. And He started them out in Jerusalem. He started them out in hometown. That's our role. We're to get the Word of God out. We have a responsibility to get the Word out here in Kernersville, Walkertown, Colfax, Sage Garden, wherever you live. We have a responsibility to get the Word of God out. James said in James chapter 5 and verse 20, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death. And shall hide a multitude of sins. Verses 11 and 12 speak not only of our responsibility, but they also speak of our record. And he asks the question in verse number 12, And shall not he render to every man according to his works? If we went to heaven right now, how many crowns would we have to lay at Jesus' feet? And Paul reminded us in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. There are stories in the Bible that, and portions of stories in the Bible that stick with me. One thing that will always stick with me is the story of Jonah. Jonah. And I've always wondered how many Ninevites died and went to hell while Jonah was out riding around on that well, or in that well, when he could have been preaching. We need to remember our role in rescuing the sinner. We have a responsibility, and God is keeping the record. We need to remember from where our strength comes from. And then lastly, we need to utilize God's Word and look at the examples left for us of God's people. And may we learn from their example and may we resolve to refuse to stay down. When we get down and out and feel like we just can't go on, why don't we take a few moments and go back to the book of Genesis? And start there around Genesis 39 and read all the way up to about Genesis 50 and read the story of Joseph, the object of his father's special love, who had been given that great gift of interpreting dreams, hated by his brothers. You know, if I'd have been a good buddy of Joseph's back in that day, and when I found out what his brothers did to him, I would, I would just say, no way God was in that. How could God ever get glory out of that? But you see, the lesson to be learned in Joseph is that time and time again, through the story of the life of Joseph, you'll find that little phrase, but the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him down in the pit. The Lord was with him when he went down to Egypt. The Lord was with him when he was sold to Potiphar. The Lord was with him when Potiphar's wife falsely accused him. The Lord was with him when he went down into prison. The Lord was with him uh, when the, those who had said they would put a good word in for him lied and never said a word. The Lord was still with him. And in God's time and in God's plan... This young man who had to be down and out, the Lord said, all right, now it's time for you to rise up. And He made him second in charge in the nation of Egypt. And because of what God did for him, because he would not stay down, because he was always 
looking unto the Lord. The Lord saved an entire nation, an entire region from starvation. He refused to stay down. David, Israel's greatest king, and according to the book of Acts, the man that was after God's own heart. Well, he got down, didn't he? Man, alive. I mean, who could blame him? Starts lusting after a woman that's not his, and she's married to another. He has a, 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 an immoral relationship with her. A child is the result of that immoral relationship. He tries his best to cover it up and hide it. and It blows up in his face. God knows all about the, his adulterous affair. God knows all about his murderous schemes. And God sends a prophet to him and tells him that story about the rich man, the poor man, the one little ewe lamb, and the traveler. David is told, you're the man that's done this. And boy, David could have just gotten down and stayed down. But Psalms 51 and verse number 10 reminds us that David went to the Lord and said unto Him, Create in me a clean heart and, and renew in me a right spirit. He didn't stay down. Oh, he had to pay an awful price the rest of his days, but he got back up and he served the Lord. Simon Peter was a man that got down. Well, can you just imagine? That's another Bible story that always has an impression on me is the story of Peter's denial of knowing the Lord. But that's not so much what sticks with me. What sticks with me is the third time that he denied the Lord and the rooster crowed. The Bible says Jesus looked at him. You know, my daddy had a way. I would rather him beat me with a stick of firewood than to look at me like he would look at me sometimes. And just, I, I man, I, was, I just needed a rock to crawl under. Felt so awful. That, that was better punishment than beating me was that look. Can you imagine looking at the Son of God the one that you had given your life for, the one that you had given up your business and your family to follow all the way. And when He needed you the most, you couldn't stay awake and you couldn't acknowledge that you knew Him. And the Lord didn't say a word to Him. He just looked at Him. And the Bible says He went out and He wept bitterly. But He didn't stay down, did He? No, he didn't stay down because he got a message from the, the Word of the Lord on Resurrection Day. The Gospel of Mark reminds us that when they got down to that tomb and, and they saw that angel, they gave him the Word and said, Go and tell my disciples and Peter. I believe he wanted Peter to get back up. I believe he wanted Peter to know he still loved him and it still had a work for him to do. And old Peter backslid and Peter went out with half of the disciples and got backslid. But boy, he got right with God. Boy, he didn't get down again. In the last chapter of the book of John, we find him out there trying to hide himself from his Lord under deep conviction of his sin, he's down as low as he can go and he, he jumps off into the water. But then in the very next book of the Bible, in Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 12, we find, we find him standing up in front of the Sanhedrin council and the Pharisees and they were telling him, don't you preach in Jesus' name. And Peter said, I'll tell you one thing, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. He didn't stay down. He got back up. But boy, if you need a, a good example, if Joseph and David and Simon Peter don't do it for you, let me give you one more. The Lord Jesus Christ. You say, He got down? Yeah, He gave His life. He laid His life down. And He was crucified on that cross in your place and mine. And they took Him down from the cross and they put Him down in that tomb, but He didn't stay down. Three days and three nights later, He arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And now He has the keys of death and hell. 
Old devil don't even have a key to his own house. Isn't that something? You just can't keep a just man down. Yes, we're going to fall. Yes, we're going to get down and discouraged. But don't stay down. Because the Bible says as many times as we go down, we're going to rise back up again. Let's remember those things. Remember where your strength comes from. Remember your role in saving or leading a sinner to Christ. And remember, don't stay down. We rise. Father, in Jesus' name, thank You for the Word of God tonight. And now we want to extend the invitation to one and all. Dear Lord, I, I, you may be dealing with hearts tonight. I don't know the issues of these folks' life like You do. What they're going through, what they're battling. You know all about it, Lord. And I pray that You'd help them tonight. I pray that something from the Word of God has been shared to encourage someone, help someone along life's way. Tonight, as we open these altars and invite folks to come, I pray, Lord, that someone may receive help tonight. If there's a lost sinner here that doesn't know Christ, pray that they would come tonight. Let us pray with them. Show them how to be born again. We'll praise you for what you do in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.